Okay, let's get started. So, hi, uh, my name is uh, Maciej Prepura, but everyone who does not speak English prefers to call me Mac, so please call me Mac. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about, about violin and grails. Uh, so, f first question, who am I? Why am I, why am I here? So, basically, I'm a husband, a father of two daughters, and a molecular biologist who turned to a software developer. I graduated in the uh, Warsaw University in molecular biology 10 years ago, and since then I have never been in a molecular biology lab, basically. So after graduating, I just started working in the IT industry. So uh, let's talk about the agenda for this presentation. Uh, I want to answer a couple of questions during this presentation. First of all, uh, why use Grails with Vadin? Uh, why is Vadin? What is Vadin, and how would you make it work with Grails? And uh, what are my plans for that? Uh, at the end of the session, hopefully, we'll have time for uh, the QA. So, let's go. Why use Grails with Vadin? Basic answer is you want to be productive, and Grails already make you productive most of the time, right? Uh, first question. How many of you have heard about Vadin? Everyone has heard. How many of you have used Vadin? Okay, so you probably guys be a bit, will be a bit bored during this session. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but anyway, uh, what is the most common way to implement UI with Grails? Hopefully not. <laughs> I mean, GSP is fine. Right, it's, it's very powerful, but developing GSP views is, I would say it's a pain, right? Because you need to be both designer and a software developer, and that doesn't, uh, doesn't happen very often, right? GSP is fine, but it's really hard to write and even harder to read, in my opinion. And uh, GSP is not very well geared to, towards uh, single page applications and AJAX, right? If, of course, you can get tons of tags that will make things easier for you, but it's no different from developing an AJAX application with JSPO, right? So I think it's not the best way using GSPs to develop an AJAX application. Uh, and yeah, instead, let's use a fully fledged framework that just allows you to build an AJAX application, right? And people can use things like React, JS, like Angular JS. then you would develop the backend for your application with Grails using uh, REST, right? Or whatever. But then you would still need to think about a couple of things that are very common for AJAX applications, communication, security, and so on, right? So hopefully, Vadin would take care of that all for you. So what is Vadin? First of all, it's a Finnish word. You might know that Vadin is actually a female reindeer in Finnish, or it may, might mean I demand. There is, I see a couple of guys from uh, the office, from BCB Medical, so those are our neighbors. Uh, okay, so Vadin, actually, you can see it in the logo, uh, that this is a reindeer's head, uh, reindeer's, reindeer's head, uh, but it's also a thing that it combines Java and HTML, right? So the brace is for Java, and the angle brace, uh, angle bracket is for HTML. Okay, so Vadin basically is a framework for creating rich internet applications in Java or in JVM language. So basically, that means that you can use any pu JVM language, purely. So there is no HTML, no JavaScript, no, no XML for configurating things. Let's think about what are rich internet applications. So what are rich internet applications? How would you define RIA? Excuse me? Yeah, that's one thing, but the, the basic idea behind RIAs is that you can have an application that would behave a lot like a desktop application, but it runs in a browser, right? 
So it allows you to build complex UIs. It doesn't reload uh, on every user interaction and so on. So, yeah. Uh, development of Vadin as a RIA framework started in 2000. Uh, the company started, uh, I think it was in September or in October. And nowadays, in 2017, we've got something like 150 developers all around the world, in 170 countries, and 6,500 cities. So that's quite a user base. Uh, what kind of applications can you create with Vadin? What kind of rich internet applications can you create with Vadin? Uh, this is one of my favorite examples because it's built on Grails. Uh, it's built with Grails 2. It's an application from uh, Senti1 uh, that is used for uh, managing and tracking uh, sentiments on trademarks in the social media. And it was developed with Grails uh, 2 and with Vadin 6. And it was built by a company that comes from Poland, actually. So that's why I like it a lot. Uh, and you can see, this, is, this looks uh, like a very rich UI. Right? There are some uh, tables, there are charts, and so on. This all was built with Vadin. Uh, and uh, one of the managers from that company uh, actually made, uh, said in a statement for us that uh, we don't need a lot of UI developers or front-end developers. Basically, Groovy developers can build these kinds of UIs, which is a nice thing. Okay. How many of you develop UIs for your applications? Some of you. OK. Uh, this is another kind of an application. That, uh, that's an application that was built uh, for uh, Orion Pharma, uh, managing stock information. So there is a large data set, a huge table, and some uh, form for editing the data in the table. Right. Other example, that's an, ex an application that we developed for Puma for uh, uh, this application is a web application. It looks like a lot like an iOS application. It was developed to be used on Safari, on iPads, but it's a web application. So this is also possible. You can style your application, theme your application to look like a native application. OK, another example, uh, business integration application. Uh, the customer that developed this application, they also uh, added a business process editor, so basically with drag and drop, users can create business processes to be executed, for example, on activity. OK, the question is, why should you use Vadin? Uh, let's start by considering the importance of user interfaces, right? User interface is pretty much all the users will see. They don't know about every, anything below. They, they might as well think of it as a magic, right? But the user interface is very important for them. So that's one thing. The other thing is that uh, when you use Vadin, you want to be productive. And you can use different technologies to create web user interfaces. But with Vadin, a lot of focus is uh, on making developer productive. So let's say you don't need to use JavaScript. JavaScript has improved a lot recently, right? With ES 2016 and so on. How many of you develop in JavaScript? OK. Do you like it? <laughs> OK. That's fine. You can use JavaScript as well with Vadin. That's not a big deal. But uh, at least for the server side part, you can use whatever JVM language, Java, Groovy. There are some people who use uh, Scala. Uh, but with Vadin, basically, the promise is that if you don't want to, you don't need to write any JavaScript. And the magic here is that uh, when we have RIA applications, rich internet applications, they usually uh, use AJAX to, to communicate with the server. Right? <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but with Vadin, communication and the browser side is handled by the framework. So what you need to focus on is developing on the server side, right? Building the UI, uh, making the logic for the UI, connecting to the services. That's all. And the pretty rich uh, component set for Vadin 
will make it easier for you to develop the UI for the application. And the nice thing about Vardin is that we currently uh, support uh, evergreen browsers. So Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Opera, latest versions, no problem. Uh, Internet Explorer 11 uh, and Edge as well. And then, of course, mobile browsers as well. Uh, that's for Vadin 8. Vadin 7, which is the previous version that we still support, uh, goes uh, even back more in time because we still have customers that need IE 8 support. Right? So. OK. Let's talk about web application architectures in general. This is the traditional way of web applications, right? We have document object model on the browser. We have view model controller on the server side. We have some database that we connect to that database. Let's say that user interacts with the DOM, clicks on something, turn, uh, types into a form, fills in the form, and clicks on the submit button, right? What we get is parameters that are sent over HTTP request to the server side. There is a front side controller that parses it, makes, 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 makes some changes to the model, maybe fetches some data from the database, generates the new page, and then sends, back, sends it back over HTTP response to the browser. Right? Not very efficient. There is a lot of HTTP talk. Uh, there is a full page reload for the user, so it's not a great user experience as well. So that's why uh, people came up with an idea for client-side rich internet applications. Fat client, right? So in the fat client uh, model, on the client side, we have the view that manages the DOM, some, some kind of uh, uh, model of the UI, some components, directives in AngularJS, whatever, right? And we have a controller that also is on the client side. When the user makes some interaction, it's the controller on the client side that parses that, that interaction, packages to it to some kind of a AJAX call, sends that call to the server side. On the server side, we have the model that connects to the database. We fetch some new data from the database. And then we send the requested data to the view back as XML. That was probably 10 years ago. Nowadays, JSON, right? So, and then this updated data is used to, to modify the document object model. And that's completely fine, but uh, we need to take care of point two and four here, right? So we need to come up with some idea for the transport. We need to secure it. We need to come up with... Uh, uh, solutions for cross-site request forgery attacks and so on. So that's quite a bit of development. So that's why at Vadin we came with an idea of server-side rich internet applications, thin clients. So on, in this model, we still have the DOM in the browser, but this DOM is attached to ad an adapter. We call it connector. And what Connector does is whenever there is an interaction from the user, it sends an AJAX request to the server side to the corresponding connector on the server side. We parse this information in the connector. We make changes to the model, fetch the data from the database, and we change the view uh, on the server. Those changes in the view are picked up by the server side connector, communicated to the, to the client side connector, and this connector, this adapter, makes changes to the DOM. Seems complicated? Maybe a bit. But the nice thing about Vardin is this all complicated part is handled by the framework for you. So you don't need to do anything about it. You just use components on the server side, add them to the layouts, and that's it. So Vardin is a component-based framework. So it has small pieces, and you build your application by combining those uh, components, right? Has any of you developed a Swing application, or SWT application, AWT application? OK. So this is a very similar model, right? This is uh, not a comprehensive list of uh, components that are baked in. 
Uh, but how it works. This is an example of VAD encode that you would typically use in your application. So you create a layout with a horizontal, let's say, horizontal layout. You create a button. You add a click listener to this button. You create another button that is cancel button. You add another uh, click listener to this button. And then you add those two buttons to the layout. And framework, Vadin framework, takes care of rendering that in the browser, of taking care of communicating clicks from the browser to the uh, server, and so on. OK, so let's talk about components architecture in Vadin. Uh, there are two parts for each component in Vadin. Uh, client side and server side. Server side is a Java component, or any JVM language actually. Uh, but in the core, in the framework, it's, uh, it's written using Java. And on the client side, we have the so-called widgets. And widgets are built with JavaScript, CSS, and of course, manipulating the DOM. So we need to use HTML for that as well. OK, web development isn't easy. You probably know it already. There are a lot of challenges that we need to face. Like, for example, different features in different browsers. This is getting more or less better, but still. Then different browsers have different performance characteristics. right? And the last thing, different browsers have different bugs that we need to work around. Right? So, how to solve the problem? <laughs> One of the solutions that was used, uh, is used in Vaden is uh, Google Web Toolkit. Uh, Google Web Toolkit, some people say it's already dead. Might be, but it works for us. And why it works? Well, it's still two things. It's a component framework, just like Vaden, but it's client-side. And then it's a compiler that compiles Java into JavaScript, right? So no JavaScript, you can just compile the Java code that looks like this, for example, a bit more convoluted. And it translates, in, it translates into optimized cross-browser JavaScript. Uh, I must add that JavaScript, pure JavaScript, if someone prefers that, works as well. Uh, and it has worked since Vadin 6. You could just create a component with uh, JavaScript, but it's not the common way. Uh, I guess that's because, uh, at least some time ago, Java tooling was way better than JavaScript tooling, right? Uh, linters, uh, static checkers, and so on. This is getting better and better. So that's why we're making Git uh, optional in, in the next uh, release of Vadi. Uh, has any of you used GruScript? GruScript. That's, uh, that's a compiler from Groovy to JavaScript. And you can use GruScript to develop uh, client-side parts of the components in Vadin as well. So it's not a big deal. OK. So widgets are actually mostly created in Git. And then there is a naming convention. If you have a button component on the server side, then you will have a vbutton widget on the client side. And that convention is most of the time uh, used, but it's not always used. There are some exceptions to it. OK, so what drives Vadin applications? It's events. It's pretty much like in a desktop application. We have a loop event, uh, event loop that runs, and we just listen for events from the user, and then we react to those events. Like, for example, we have a text field created here, we have a button created here, and we have a click listener added to this button. What happens when the user loads the application in the browser? Uh, initial web page contains some basic HTML and the bootstrap Java JavaScript that will load all the necessary things, like the theme, that's the CSS, and uh, images that are required, icons, SVG. And then the widget set, the compiled JavaScript for uh, components. Then the theme is something around uh, 174 kilobytes. And then the widget set, if it's not optimized, it will be something like one megabyte. But we can 
make this uh, data a lot smaller by optimizing the widget set and by enabling compression on the server side. Okay. The page loads. We have the application running in the browser. Uh, client side renders the component that we created on the server side. There is no HTML, no JavaScript custom. JavaScript, is, it's all handled by GWT for you. Let's type something into the uh, text field and let's click on the button. What happens is that when this button is clicked, we get an HTTP AJAX request to the server. And this HTTP AJAX uh, request is parsed on the server and it makes the click listener for, that was added to the button to, to be called. This click listener adds a notification. So we send a response to the browser that says add a, not a notification and the notification is displayed. Okay, and there are different kinds of uh, listeners depending on the uh, components they have on IP APIs for adding listeners. Like for example, if you have a tree, you can add a, an expand listener. If you, if you have a text field, you can not only add a value change listener, but you can also add a text change listener that will listen to the changes while the user types in. So that might be used uh, for implementing things like uh, search box, right? Okay. So how it works? It all works by keeping the session and application state on the server side. A VADIN application is tied to an HTTP session. This HTTP session can be manually closed or um, when the user, for example, logs out, or can be timed out by the server. Then each session can have multiple UIs. UI is the root of your uh, component hierarchy in VADIN, right? So when you create an application, it's like, I don't know, JFrame in Swing, and one UI instance is always tied to one browser tab. Uh, UIs can be stored between page refreshes, but that could cause some problems, some issues. So that's why, by default, when the user uh, re, uh, refreshes the page in the browser, Vadin will create a new UI instance. Okay. Now, there might be a question. Is it scalable? So, what do you think? Is it scalable or not? If we keep all the data on the server side. Well, we have found out that the limiting factor is actually memory. And we were able uh, to run a sample application that uh, had 11,000 active concurrent users before actually degrading the performance. Uh, this was run on Amazon EC2 large instance, and yeah, it worked. Uh, one thing to add, uh, the database was running on a different uh, machine. Okay. So, again, how to make Grails work with Vaadin? There is no magic, at least in my solution. Uh, I just use uh, Spring Boot. Uh, I think I saw it in the uh, Grails uh, tutorial. Grails applications are Spring Boot applications in disguise. So, fortunately, uh, we at Vadin have developed uh, an add-on, uh, a plugin for the framework that allows you to use uh, Vadin with Spring, with Spring Boot, and there is also Spring Boot Starter. So, basically, by just including those in your Grails application and including Vadin library, you can start using Vadin in your application. And that's what I created so far. Uh, there is a web Vadin 8 uh, profile. Uh, how many of you use uh, profiles in your Grails application? Not many. Uh, that's, uh, that's a new thing uh, in Grails 3.1, I think, uh, that allows you to have a template for the application, basically. And this template just includes uh, those uh, dependencies that I mentioned before. Okay. Uh, you might wonder, what are the other options for using uh, Vadin with Grails? Well, you can always just manual hack it, manually uh, hack it, and it can work, right? So you just 
create a Vadin servlet that extends a core framework Vadin servlet. You can create things like uh, annotations for annotating views, UIs, and so on. Then there are two libraries on GitHub that were uh, had some pretty intensive uh, development some time ago. One is Vadin for Grails. Uh, the other one is Vadin on Grails.com. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of development recently for both of these. I mean, those are dedicated for Vadin 7 and for Grails too. So if you want to be uh, work on a more recent stack, this is, at least I know that Vadin on Grails is uh, going through some uh, development and it will be updated to Grails 3 and uh, Vadin 8, but uh, it's being ported from the previous version, so it doesn't use the, all the magic that Spring Boot gives you. Okay, so, I'm sorry. We're talking about uh, other options. Uh, so if there are those other options, why use this web Vadin 8 profile? Uh, I mean, I started developing it, uh, truth be told, to have a topic for my master thesis. Uh, as I said before, I graduated molecular biology. I'm doing my master thesis in, I, uh, in information sciences nowadays, and my professor is very much into Grails and into Groovy, so uh, he liked the idea. Uh, so that's why I started it, but I think it's actually going to uh, uh, be quite helpful for people who want to use Vadin uh, with Grails. Okay, so as I said before, currently the profile only manages the dependencies for you, so it just includes all the dependencies that you want to have to start using uh, uh, Grails in Vadin, uh, Vadin in Grails application. So maybe a quick demo. So this is fairly easy. Uh, the uh, profile is actually listed in uh, official uh, Grails uh, profiles repository. So if you want to start using it, you can create new application. So this is the coordinates for the profile. Oh yeah, the name. Okay, let's go to IntelliJ. That's how would the application created by this command would look like. So we've, it's just a regular Grails application. Things that are different is first thing, build Gradle file that includes VOD independencies. And Spring Boot, Vadin Spring Boot Start and Vadin Spring Boot dependency. The other thing is that in the Grails app folder, it creates a new uh, subfolder for Vadin classes, right? And then there is a sample uh, Vadin UI created for you already. So let's run this application. Yeah, it takes a while to boot. And when it starts, it will launch the browser for us. So yeah, Grails application, right? Nothing has changed. Why? 
And that's because, uh, as I said before, I'm using uh, the Spring Boot add-on. And this Spring Boot add-on allows you to have whatever you already have in your Rails application or Spring Boot application. And it allows you to map the UIs that you create in Vadin to a specific path, right? So you can mix, actually. You can mix uh, Vadin with whatever other view technology you have. And that's actually, that's, I think, the most powerful thing in this solution because it allows you to have public face inside developed in Grails and, I don't know, React, Angular, GSP, whatever you like. And then, if you want to build the administrative views, you can use Vadin for that, right? Like, for example, views for managing posts or things like that. So, let's go to Vadin UI. Okay, so there is a button. Yeah, we created a new button. And when the user clicks on this button, we will show a notification. Not very much, right? So, this is what works now. And not, that's not very much, but still, getting there was a bit of a pain for me because uh, there are different parts of the documentation that are not very complete. So, making this work actually took me a while. Uh, anyway, uh, so what am I planning next? Then uh, the next thing that should be there to make it actually usable is injecting services into UIs so that you can actually use Hibernate, GORM, because this would, wouldn't work right now. Because uh, if you try to use it, uh, if you would try to do a, qu a query on, a, uh, on a uh, domain class, it would just spit with, uh, uh, an exception that there is no Hibernate session created, right? So I, that's one thing that needs to be hooked, yeah? Yeah. The, the, that wouldn't work because uh, Vadin is it's a completely different mindset, right? So uh, controllers just won't work there. Uh, controllers are <sighs> kind of a different beast, right? Because Vadin works in that way that it keeps the state of the application, the whole state, on, on the server side, in the, in the memory. So uh, you can even enable push so that you can have a background thread that will update the UI uh, for you. So it's the controller word just doesn't fit into this model, right? So basically, we need, I need to implement something that would mimic the controller's behavior. Then uh, there, there is a need for a Gradle plugin for common tasks, like, for, for example, compiling the theme for the application. And we use SASS uh, for uh, themes, so this needs to be compiled to CSS for uh, production, right? Uh, when you're doing the development, uh, the servlet, the Valin servlet, would actually automatically compile the uh, theme for you so that you can make changes on the fly, but it won't work on the production, right? Uh, the other thing that is needed is uh, a task for Gradle that will allow you compiling the widget set. The, uh, currently, I'm using the pre-compiled widget set that is uh, distributed with Valin, but if you want to use add-ons like, for example, maps or anything like that, it won't work. Uh, you can manually compile this, but this is, it's a pain to actually configure the command. Then, hooking the security, the Spring security, uh, so that you can annotate the views uh, in your Vadin application and have the security, uh, the Spring security, check it for you if, if the user, for example, can access the view. Then, one big thing that I'm thinking of is uh, declarative UI, the DSL, so that you could write things like that. Horizontal layout, a closure, inside the closure we create things, and that's it, right? And you can, could even hook uh, click listeners there, or any kind of listeners there. Then one thing that might be useful at some point uh, would be uh, support for model view presenter uh, pattern. Have you heard about it? Okay. So, uh, for example, for creating uh, model and view and presenter automatically for you so that everything is just hooked and you don't need to write this manually. And hopefully at some point this will be 
will uh, become community driven. So uh, basically whatever community would need there will end up there. Okay, so if you want to get more information about Vadin, uh, I would like to invite you to vadin.com slash webinars. Uh, we are also planning to do a, a webinar that will be devoted to Vadin and Grails applications development uh, at some point, probably in two to three months. Uh, you can also ask questions on our forum. So you are invited to uh, go to vadin.com slash forum. And then, yeah. Do you have any questions now? Yeah. It's Java. So basically any IDE. Uh, we have plugin for Eclipse. Uh, IntelliJ does not, well, IntelliJ has uh, their own plugin that is developed by, by JetBrains, but honestly, it sucks. Uh, but uh, there is a Maven plugin for uh, uh, Vadin that pretty much covers all needs. And uh, there is also a third party Gradle plugin, but it has some problems with configurations when using it with uh, Gradle, so that's why I not, I, I'm not using it uh, in this solution. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say the tooling is pretty much okay. Uh, so, yeah. Any other th uh, questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's correct. That's correct. You cannot. But this is coming really soon, like next week. <laughs> uh, I need to. Uh, I I need. To, I what what I mean with that? I need to get my master thesis done quite soon. So uh, there's. Yeah. Yeah. Services. That's that's the idea. Uh, and um, with MVP support, what, would you, what you would actually do, you would have instances of uh, services injected to presenters, right? So that's how it would work. Okay, any other questions? Yeah? Uh, well, it's open source. Uh, the sources are on GitHub. It's just that there is no, not big community around it so far because it's not that power, powerful. So, uh, so uh, I'm working for Vadin, and actually we are allowed to spend 10% of our time at, uh, at work for whatever community uh, project we can come up with, and that's my community. Uh, so-called Community Friday. So every every second Friday, I I spend my time on that, yeah. uh, the work. And hopefully, I hope that it will it will be compelling for people to use it, so that the community will build around it. Uh, actually, many of our official add-ons that are developed by Vadim started that way. So, the, for example, the Spring add-on, uh, uh, Spring integration suite. Uh, started as a Community Friday project of one of our colleagues, but it, it's so, so much interest in from uh, our customers that we actually promoted it to uh, an official add-on. So, yeah. Wait. Uh, well... Well, GWT is no, uh, not Google's project anymore. There is a steering committee, a uh, GWT steering committee, that uh, governs uh, GWT. Of course, Google still contributes a lot to GWT. Uh, we're waiting for 3.0. <laughs> that's, that's basically the, the story. But we're seeing that Google is probably going to abandon GWT at some point. So uh, that's why we're making it uh, that's one of the reasons uh, we're going to make it optional. The other reason is that currently JavaScript has changed so far and it's getting so, more, so much more traction that it might be that in the future you will develop the client side of your uh, Vadin components in JavaScript. 
you can do this already, but it's it's not the default way. Okay, any other questions? John. Okay. I hope you I gave you some food for thought and you will visit our site. So Okay, thanks. Bye. And Unfortunately, I won't be able to stay uh, for the whole conference. I, I have my flight in something like three hours, so. <laughs>